and Expat Academy event. In the context of the current economic climate, it has never been more important to manage your employment costs efficiently. So today, the BDO team will take a look at what's going on in employment and explain how you can get the most benefit out of your employment spend. They'll also explore how to structure and potentially benefit from a flexible workforce and the employment tax implications of agile working arrangements. Crucially, they'll help you to minimize the unnecessary costs of any penalties from getting employment tax compliance wrong. I'm Linda Brennan from the Expat Academy and with me today from the BDO employment law team, we have Caroline, John, Claire and Jackie, who will be sharing their knowledge and experience of both national and global tax and compliance. Please feel free to put your comments and questions in the Q&A box as we go along. There'll be time set aside at the end for questions and we'll try to make sure we answer all of your questions. If we aren't able to, then we will get back to you individually after the webinar. We'll also be making the slides available to you after the event. So now I'd just like to hand over to Caroline to get us started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. My name is Caroline Harwood and I am the National Head of Employment Tax here at BDO in the UK. Um, next slide, please. And next slide. And another one. Thank you very much, Nestle. I'm going to start by talking about the context that we're looking at at the moment and then go on to see uh, um, some more of the detail of, of what in practice employers are facing, the decisions that you're making and the implications that those are having potentially. So let's start by having a look at the data from the latest um, Office for National Statistics report, which was published on the 17th of January 2023. So it's, it's pretty up to date. It gives you figures to November 2022. Looking first at unemployment, it's quite heartening at first sight to see that employment is largely unchanged. It's currently at 3.7%, which is still 1% less than pre-pandemic. Um, however, in a recent report by Career Wallet, um, it was highlighted that employees have been sufficiently impacted by the cost of living crisis that more than one in 10 have been looking at finding a second job. So the question here is, are we looking at a steady state in terms of unemployment rates? Or actually, are we looking at more people losing one job, but others taking on a second job, plugging that gap? We'll have to look at the next set of data to see what happens going forwards. In that context, we have just over 1 million vacancies um, within the UK. The number of vacancies has been falling consistently for the last six quarters. And historically, it's, it's quite high. If you look at data going backwards, pre, again, before the pandemic, that reflects the uncertainty that we're currently facing in the economy. The economically inactive currently amount to 21 and a half million. Now that's a decrease of 0.1% compared to the previous quarter. But where it becomes interesting is, is what demographics are actually changing? Is it across the board or not? And it's not. If you look at the youngest, the 20 to 24 year olds, economic inactivity is decreasing. If you look at the top end, economic inactivity is increasing. Um, but in the middle, it's fairly steady state. So we're looking at the impact of students taking up or stopping studying and getting a job the impact of illness um, in the older generation, and of course, obviously retirement. Payrolled employees um, is an interesting statistic. During the pandemic, there was a decrease in payrolled employees, not huge, but there was a decrease, but there was a massive increase in the number of self-employed as people started to work for themselves from home and take advantages um, from where those were presented within, within the opportunities arising from different work at home businesses during the pandemic. The number of payroll employees is going up. So it's up 28,000 in the last quarter, which represents just a small increase, but it is an increase. And as I said, the number of self-employed did go up, but it's now decreasing as more people are moving from a self-employed status back into paid work. And again, this could be symptomatic of the uncertainty that people are facing in the current economic climate. The redundancy rate expected to increase. 
Um, sadly, businesses are failing. We've seen some large household names not doing so well. And we're currently looking at 3.4 jobs per thousand lost in the quarter to the end of November. So next slide, please. So the, the question then is, how is that impacting us as employers? What are we having to do? What are we seeing in the marketplace? First thing that comes to mind is pay increases. And we're seeing an awful lot in the news about what the rates of pay increases are. Um, and the ONS data shows that the growth in pay in the last quarter was 6.4%. And you could split that to a growth, growth of 7.2% in the private sector and 3.3% in the public sector. Now, in the public sector, it's a lot higher at um, the lower paid end of the spectrum um, than in the private sector. So that's interesting to see and perhaps driven by taking on board changes in, for instance, national minimum wage, which I'll come back to in a second. Interesting data from expert HR shows that the median pay rise was 5% in the three months to the end of December 2020, 2022. In the same period in 2021, it was just 2.3%. So the median pay rise has doubled in a 12 month period. A quarter will pay reviews take place in January, so it'll be very interesting to see what the next set of data shows us. We'll have to go back and look at that in due course. However, so we're looking at healthy pay rises at the, on the face of it, but as we all know, in the context of inflation, um, in real terms, pay fell by 2.6%, and that has led to widespread pay disputes and industrial action. 467,000 working days were lost because of labour disputes in the quarter to November 2022, and that's the highest number since November 2011. So it's a long time since we've seen um, strikes to the extent that we're looking at at the moment. Do we address this with pay rises, as has been the demands from many of the unions? Well, the Bank of England has warned us that pay at higher pay rises, increasing pay levels could result in the higher levels of inflation becoming embedded long term. Economically, that's something we want to avoid, but it puts employers in a dilemma. What do you do? You've got to juggle the demands for more pay in the context of a competitive labour market and rising, ever rising business input costs. So what we're seeing happening is a refresh of what employees want and what employers are able or prepared to give. So many job applicants now see hybrid working as a given. It's often balanced against pay. It seems a vital working condition. The younger generations coming up, Generation Z, et cetera, expect good work-life balance. And they see that as, as essential in their future career. We've got the increases in national minimum wage. They're roughly 10% across the board. And those are gonna bite in April, 2023. And demand for candidate um, supply is higher than the number of candidates available, but that trend is slowing. Now that may impact the one third of employees who are currently considering moving a job. The reason for that generally is stated as being higher pay, but if we're seeing a decrease in the number of, of roles available, that may slow that trend. So we might not see quite as large a move as employees might hope. They also might not be able to meet their pay expectations if those roles at the price they want are not available. And finally, we have, because we have all of the input costs rising, we're also seeing contractor rates increasing as well. So businesses are considering the best way that they can structure their work workforce. Now more than ever, what employers need to be doing is maximizing bang for their buck in terms of employee spend, spending it wisely, and making sure that they don't get it wrong and waste money on penalties, interest, etc., or even things that employees don't value. So now I'm gonna hand you over to my fellow partner, John Chaplin, who's going to tell you more about flexible working. Over to you, John. Thank you, Caroline. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, uh, one of the interesting stats in, in Caroline's session was the number of people who are on a self-employed basis. Uh, and as you may recall, uh, it was at its peak at around 5 million people. Now is, is down to about 4.2 million pounds, but is on the rise again. Um, and it's not surprising that that happened largely because of, of uh, the pandemic when people realised that unfortunately being self-employed meant um, there was no income coming in. So they had to, to look elsewhere for, for uh, income and therefore look to employment, etc. Um, but... But the um, uh, factors which influence employees moving to self-employment and vice versa um, 
These change pretty much on an annual basis, and we'll have a look at them, a few of them in a moment. But what actually it means is that overall, there is a still a push towards self-employment um, from employees, never mind from employers wanting more flexibility in their workforce. So my prediction is that within a couple of years, I would suggest that we'll probably be up back to around the five million peak um, from a self-employment uh, perspective as people get more comfortable and hopefully we come out of the current economic crisis and everything else that uh, Caroline's just covered. Now, the traditional employment model uh, was one where you left education, you got a job, you might move once, twice, three, four times if you were a bit of a pioneer, um, and then eventually you get to 60, 65 and you'd retire and that would be job done. That's been changing for a lot of years now and it's starting to become something which is more and more driven by the employees. They require flexibility, uh, they want to be entrepreneurial, they may not want to be doing one full-time job, more likely they want, could be wanting to do um, more than one part-time role in maybe even different sectors, etc. Um, and COVID has probably crystallised some of the thinking in terms of how people want to work. So employment status is not one which is automatically the viewed uh, bastion that it, it once was, both from an employee and an employer perspective. In this session, I'm going to have a look at um, the pros and cons, um, some of the risks, obviously, how to control those risks and, and how to, to feel comfortable that whatever choices you make as, as a, an engager of workers, um, it, it's the right thing for both for you and for them. So next slide, please, Natalie. I think it's first worth saying, well, what do we mean by flexible workers? You can call them contingent workers, you can call them off payroll, you can call them self-employed, all sorts of things. I suppose rather flippantly, what I'm, what I'm talking about is anybody that you engage in a personal capacity that isn't on your payroll. Some of the obvious ones are in the first four, so sole traders, people who are engaging with you um, on an individual basis and being treated as self-employed. Uh, so Fred Smith coming to, to work for you as Fred Smith. Um, uh, limited company contractors, so Fred Smith Limited contracting uh, with you through uh, his limited company, that example. Um, down to outsourcing models, you might have an independent business that provides everything from your IT outsourcing, your uh, staff canteen, your facilities management, whatever else it may well be within your business. And then lastly, what are probably often referred to as consultants. These are the people who aren't necessarily through their limited companies or, or perhaps they have um, a, a slightly um, increased status because of their vast experience or because of their um, higher potential earnings. So they're, they're sort of put slightly above, dare I say it, self-employed or, or limited company contracts because they're being brought in to, to give their sage-like advice in particular instances. But also don't forget that there are, there are benefits, there are pros and cons of using all sorts of off payroll type of workers, mainly off your payroll, but on somebody else's payroll, for example, um, agency workers being the obvious example, uh, casual workers, you can't forget those because I think sometimes people do and they don't realise that um, uh, they come with their own potential risks, at least from an employment law and a, a tax perspective. And then last but not least, the non-execs. Uh, again, a, a common problem we often see are, are people who are brought in as board advisors, maybe having a non-exec capacity to the board, but being treated in a, a, an off-payroll, self-employed um, way. So let's have a look at, at what um, uh, this, this means. So next slide, please. Now, this is just a very quick example, and, and you know, please don't take it as being the, the be all and end all of, of what you could be doing if you have somebody not on your payroll. I must stress at this point that there's no um, intention on my behalf to say, oh, well, you have to have a look at all of your employees and trying to, to get them into some off payroll working perspective. Um, so uh, neither am I saying that anybody who's off payroll is automatically a high risk and you really ought to get them on the payroll uh, as soon as you can. The truth is it's somewhere in the middle. You have to look at how you need to utilise your uh, workers, whether they need to be your employees, the pros and cons of that. But let's just have a look at some numbers first. Um, as you can see here, I've used an example of £50,000 and looked at the employer 
national insurance costs, friendship levy and various other bits and pieces, a, a matching employer pension contribution of 5%, and miscellaneous benefits, whatever they may well be, but those, those probably on the low side for, for many employees now, that might be slightly higher in a typical employment model. And we mustn't forget holiday pay as well. And again, I've put a, um, a, an average there for, for um, what um, uh, is typically provided as a base level under the uh, statutory rights to employees. And you can see that in theory, if you were to have somebody working for you, not as your employee, you could reduce your cost by 32% in that example. Um, however, and it's a large however, is um, the, the alter, alternate side of the coin is that if they were to be engaged with you on a contract basis, um, typically uh, engaging a contractor to do a similar to role to, to one that you might have as a, an employee, it's, it's, there's no hard and fast because the different sectors and different roles, etc. change, but um, the average rate for that is about a 35% uplift over what you would pay them on a, an employed basis. So actually, from a cost perspective, it's as broad as it is long. So, so don't enter into having people um, off payroll just for the cost savings, because you might actually be having hidden costs in your business that you, you don't necessarily realise. Next slide, please. However, um, what you do have are some benefits from having a flexible workforce. As I mentioned, there is potential for employer savings in terms of costs. They don't always... Um, look as high as perhaps you might think on the, the first place. More often, though, they give you greater flexibility. So dare I say it, the ability to increase or decrease worker numbers as, the, uh, as your business requirements um, uh, decide for you. There may be less admin. Um, you hopefully won't um, need to get uh, uh, HR team involved in lots of contractors but you will have increased procurement activity and finance team in terms of paying invoices as well. So, so less admin might be less admin in one area and a greater admin in another. However, I think it's reasonably safe to say that uh, off payroll workers tend to um, give you an increased level of productivity. That's only if you have them perhaps on a shorter to medium term basis. If, if they've been with you for so long that they're starting to become Part of the furniture well then there's no probably no difference in terms of productivity to between them and a full-time permanent employee but somebody who comes in for a relatively short period of time to deliver on a on an output based project is more likely to be um, uh, motivated to get that project complete and to get the productivity sorted and everybody benefits from that perspective next slide please however Let's, let's be honest, there are risks, not least um, if you engage somebody on a, an off payroll basis and that worker turns out to have, uh, have been one that should have been on your payroll, there's a large chunk of pay as you earn an NIC liabilities which could come your way. I will not steal Jackie's thunder by going into detail on that, um, she will be talking about the, the downsides of, of, uh, of getting things wrong uh, in her session, but you can't underestimate that I'm afraid. There's also a, um, a, a, an obvious thing that's missed at times, which is the fact that workers may not be employees for income tax purposes, but still qualify for worker rights, such as pensions, working time regulations, holiday pay and the like. So, so don't assume that just because somebody isn't having pay as you earn an NSC deducted at source, that you don't have to worry about those things. If you do get it wrong, there's reputation damage. Um, I'm not going to name any companies, but I'm sure you could name a few yourself in terms of organisations that have come under criticism over the last few years for having people on a self-employed basis when it's difficult to perhaps justify why they weren't on, on the books. And also, you shouldn't underestimate the cost of defending a, a challenge, whether that be from HMRC or or employment tribunals. It, it would be not the first time when uh, clients have done deals with HMRC or indeed the employee stroke self-employed person concerned because it's it's quicker and easier and more cost effective to, to do the deal than have the argument. Um, and then last but not least, some organisations um, find themselves getting into the stage where commercially it doesn't work to have people on a self-employed basis, uh, sorry, on an employed basis so that when, when HMRC or the courts deem them to be employees, all of a sudden that element of business is not commercially viable anymore. So watch out for, for, for the cost basis 
um, uh, wagging the the uh, the uh, tax dog on that example. Okay, next slide, please. Some brief warning signs. If you've got these in your business, then then perhaps you need to have a look at um, whether or not uh, you should review the status of the workers that are concerned. Uh, if you've got, if it's very difficult to decide which of those people are employees or self-employed. Maybe you've got people who are previously employees doing very similar roles um, to, to what they did when they were employees or self-employed people working in your business that are working alongside employees. That's a maybe perfectly fine, but it's certainly a warning sign. Uh, I've already mentioned the commercial uh, indicators there. If, it, if you're only doing it because it doesn't make sense to, to operate on a payroll basis, then that's a, a danger sign. Um, just because competitors are treating people as off payroll or you might be doing so in a different country doesn't necessarily make it the right decision. So make the right decision on your facts, not on what somebody else or, or a different country might be doing. Very much of a rule of thumb is key workers, people in senior management roles, people in a, in a role where they're making decisions um, on behalf of your business. It's difficult to see how they might not be um, employees or at least having to be dealt with as such for, for tax purposes. And this session isn't about um, uh, employment status per se in terms of the HMRC or the court's views on control and mutuality and personal service. But just to say, if you're telling somebody what to do, when to do it, where to do it, um, they've got a contract with you which says they will be doing it for a certain fixed period of time and you've got a mutuality to provide that work for them for that period of time. And it must be them that does it. They can't send a substitute to do that work. It starts to look a little bit more like an employee. So, um, uh, situation. And last but not least, keep an eye on what HMRC say and what tribunals are doing, because sometimes um, there's another case off to left field, which bears a striking resemblance to what you may be doing, in which case, if you ignore that, there's case precedent, which will be used against you, I'm afraid. Okay, next slide, please, Natalie. So last but not least, what can you do in order to manage the risk? Now, the first thing, and probably the most important thing, is the tracking. I know it sounds obvious, but make sure, please, that you, you know who in your business is off payroll. Now, that could be people who go through all of the models I mentioned at the beginning. But basically, one of the biggest problems I find is that organisations, when they start looking into who they have off payroll, find a few, then a few more, then a lot more. And often they end up with a number which is probably about double what they started out with. So... Uh, the rule of thumb there is that if HMRC were to send you a, a letter tomorrow demanding that information, you typically have 30 days to provide it. So do you have that at hand or could you get it fairly quickly? If not, maybe you need to do something about it. Controls and policies are very important. You might have standard contracts. You might have um, a clear process in terms of who manages your off payroll process, whether that's legal, whether it's HR, procurement, or a mixture of all of the above, me, um, including the tax team, obviously. Um, and then uh, do you have any role-based assessments? So do you have any rules where you say, well, we're never ever going to have that type of role or that category of worker working for us in any other way than going through the payroll? But this type of category of worker, we might, that, that that's more acceptable, particularly if they're doing, for example, um, a, a contract where it, it delivers um, something at the end of it. It's a, it's a, a product-based delivery rather than a, a time and materials basis. Um, uh, training to your staff, um, knowledge is power, as they always say. So if you have people regularly engaging off payroll workers, it's worth keeping them in the loop in terms of what the rules say. And last but not least, check. So review it probably once every couple of years, I would suggest, so you can, you can still say that you are comfortable with whatever you're doing. If you follow those processes, you've got the knowledge in order to make um, the decisions that, that you need to make and to amend and to change if you need to make any changes. So I'm going to um, uh, leave it at that. Obviously, we've got questions at the end, so I'm happy to pick up anything on that basis. Um, at this point, I'll hand over to Claire, my, Claire Murray, my colleague, and he's going to talk to you about cost-effective employment. Thank you. Thank you, John, and good afternoon to everybody. I have about 20 minutes to cover what is a huge topic of cost-effective employment. So by necessity, I will only be able to cover these things at a very high level. And my aim is to highlight some of the key aspects to consider 
and give a flow of the topics which are coming up in conversations with our clients. Next slide, please. Firstly, my apologies for the slide's title. Bang for your buck is not usually an expression I, I use, but I think it neatly encapsulates um, what employers are, or if they're not, perhaps should be, um, aiming for here in terms of maximizing the value of expenditure on their employees and by maximizing both the perceived and actual value of that expenditure in the hands of their employees. So as a first step in considering this, it's worth understanding what the current cost to the business is in delivering benefits to employees. And I know John sort of alluded to that earlier, and obviously whether that cost is valued by employees. And in looking at cost of the employee, it's the, obviously the cost to reward in all forms, including cash and benefits funded by the employer and employer NIC. Um, and should also take into account the indirect costs, such as the time spent on administering benefits and reporting them, and possibly even the cost of reporting them or related advice if this is outsourced to a third party. Even when, and maybe especially when, benefits are implemented in conjunction with salary sacrifice and thus funded by the employee, by the salary foregone, the administration aspect should not be forgotten. It is very important to ensure that the arrangements support the employees have properly forgone their salary. In an international business where the benefit arrangements may be rolled out globally, it is sometimes forgotten that what might be cost or tax effective in one jurisdiction is not necessarily so in another. Um, and that also then has implications for both the business and its employees. Another aspect I think is often forgotten is the ad hoc benefits which are received by employees, such as team meals and drinks and social events and food and drink near the office, even where business matters are discussed. And with limited exceptions where exemptions can be utilised, such costs are taxable on employees. And it's usual for the costs to be included in the annual PAYE settlement agreement or PSA computation. And then the income tax and NIC um, settled by the employer on a gross start basis. So do you actually know um, the cost of uh, benefits settled in in the PSA, including income tax and NIC. So for every £100 of expenditure, the additional tax on the top is, and hopefully for the click it will appear. Yeah, so the actual cost is nearly um, £90 for a higher, for a sort of 40% tax bear. So um, that's you know, nearly doubling the actual cost of the original benefit. So a time when businesses are trying to reduce costs or maximise the value from their expenditure, it's definitely worth considering the level of spend in this area and whether it is matched by the perceived value from the employee's perspective. And more generally, from the employee's point of view, where employees have a fixed benefits package and an example of a very widely offered benefit is private medical insurance. Is that what employees want or would they rather have gym membership? Obviously, there are reasons why employers like their employees to have access to private medical cover. Um, and even where employees are able to select some of their benefits, and that could be either through some sort of discretionary benefit offering or a full flexible benefit scheme, are the benefits that offer actually desirable to employees? If employees do request other offerings, the income tax, and I see reporting implications have to be understood, even if the tax efficiency is not the main driver for, for the implementation so that the business can evaluate the true cost, including the administrative aspects. And for the purpose of day, I'm ignoring the AT and corporation tax, but they obviously should be considered as well. Also, whilst I'm focusing on this area sort of from a UK perspective, um, the implications and potential complexities in the context of a globally mobile workforce obviously need to be factored in as well. These aspects are all relevant to making decisions about whether implementing change is both achievable and desirable. And as with any aspect of employee reward, need to be kept under review and the correct proportion of treatment applied. And Jackie will cover a little later the implications of getting it wrong. Next slide, please. As income tax analysis is one aspect of maximising the value of employer spend, it would be helpful to recap the key principles which apply to the taxation of employer benefits in the UK. Obviously, if employees are working in multiple jurisdictions or in the UK temporarily, then there will be additional considerations. 
Also, just to note that I am covering key principles only. So UK tax legislation is complex, not least because of the various anti-avoidance measures which have been introduced at various times or interpretations from case law. And therefore, I'm ignoring aspects such as whether a benefit might be considered a readily convertible asset or is caught by legislation commonly referred to as disguised remuneration. But obviously, any potential implications would need to be under understood before implementing anything new. I'm also ignoring cash-based reward on the assumption that its treatment is widely understood. So how are benefits valued for tax purposes in the UK? Well, the key principle is that taxable value is the cost to the employer unless other specific legislation applies, which overrides this. The so cost in this context means the cost of the actual benefit, as well as any costs incurred in securing and providing the benefit, which would then be apportioned across all employees where relevant. So accordingly, when employers can use their corporate spending power to secure and provide benefits at a lower cost than employees could by directly obtaining that same benefit themselves, this discount is not taxable, provided no expense be incurred in securing that discount. And further, it's worth just noting that there's been historic case law which has established which benefits which are in-house, that is sort of goods or services which the employer ordinarily sells as part of its business, the cost for tax purposes when providing that same item to employees is the marginal cost rather than the full cost which would be charged to customers. And the leading case on this was um, related to public school and determining the taxable value of the education received by the children who teach at school. But, and, but the case held that the taxable value was not the fees charged to parents in general, but was limited to the direct costs of educating those teachers' children. So that seems an example of such as books and, and writing materials. And this was on the basis that the costs related to the schools of teaching staff and the premises and so on would have been incurred by the employer, regardless of whether the employed children attended the school. So whilst that was a specific case, this principle can be applied to any business where relevant. But obviously, care needs to be taken to ensure that the marginal cost is properly valued. And as noted, there are specific valuation rules which apply to certain items. So things like cars and vans and their related fuel for private use, living accommodation, loans, assets provided or transferred, and shares and share options. The specific rules do need to be understood. Um, so one is on UK income tax consequences for employees and the class 1A NIC cost of the business. And obviously it needs to be remembered that there are these rules that um, determine the tax value. Um, but do not necessarily reflect you know, the value for other taxes or indeed the actual cost to the business of providing that benefit. So all of that needs to be kind of wrapped up and understood to understand the true cost to, to you as employer of providing that benefit. And to prevent a taxable benefit arising, employees can make good the cost to the employer by, by the 6th of July following the tax year end. And this reduces obviously the cost to the, to the employer providing the benefit. Um, but making good needs to be funded from the employee's net pay. Um, and the amount which needs to be good, made good just follows the principles I've just outlined. Um, and therefore, if the cost of this purpose is less than the cost which the employee would have paid themselves directly, the employee is still better off. So a common example of this is corporate gym membership, where the employer can secure a discounted rate at a local gym. Some benefits are specifically exempt from income tax under UK tax legislation. Where they're exempt from income tax, usually there's also an exemption from NIC. And I'll cover some specific examples on the next slide, but at, at this point, I just wanted to cover the principles. And typically, tax exemptions have conditions applied to them in order for exemption to apply. And only if all required conditions are met is the benefit then exempt from income tax and NIC. Um, um, it's worth noting the criteria differ quite significantly between the various exemptions and therefore it is necessary to understand all those relevant criteria in order to conclude whether or not the exemption applies and obviously when implementing a new benefit whether or not it's feasible for those requirements to be met. This may not preclude the benefit being offered but it'd be relevant to the cost of the business and to the you know into the employees their tax consequences and related communications. And in particular, some benefits have um, a requirement that the benefit is made available to all employees. And obviously, if this basic condition is not met, then the exemption will not apply, regardless of whether all the other criteria can be complied with. Um, and available to all employees condition does not mean that all employees need to take up the benefit, but that they are able to do so. 
Historically, it was possible to design benefits packages in conjunction with salary sacrifice arrangements. The employee gave up taxable salary in exchange and an exchange received a tax-free benefit, saving the employee income tax and then I see and saving the employer and I see with, with the salary from gone funding the cost of the benefit. And see as noted just now, the, the cost of administration reporting should not be forgotten. But in 2017, new legislation was introduced, well, perhaps not so new nowadays, um, governing optional remuneration arrangements, commonly referred to as OPRA for short, which effectively ended this ability, ability to turn taxable cash into tax free benefit with, with some limited exceptions. So the legislation essentially requires the taxable value of the benefit to be the higher of the salary foregone or the cost for tax purposes of the benefit. So this therefore not only applies to salary sacrifice arrangements, also situations where employees can choose between receiving cash or a benefit. So the, the choice perhaps is um, a you know, car allowance or a company car being made available as the common example here. A general principle relating to the benefits is that where the benefits are arranged and provided by the employer, that is, it is a genuine benefit and not a cost reimbursed to employee, and therefore only employer class 1A NIC is due on the taxable value and there is no employee NIC. So accordingly, even where those formerly tax-free benefits are taxable in consequence of the opt legislation, um, with the brothers and arrangements involving salary sacrifice, it can still generate employee NIC savings. So for employees who are earning sufficient of a marginal tax NIC rate of 2%, the benefit to the employee is modest, whereas for employees liable to NIC at 12%, so probably those earning below £50,000 at present, the saving is likely to be more attractive. But it is essential to comply with national minimum wage legislations, however, and so that regardless that salary sacrifice can deliver cost savings to more modestly paid employees, their salary levels must be compliant with the required minimum. And as a final note, as alluded to earlier, um, if implementing a salary sacrifice arrangement, it is necessary to ensure that it is implemented correctly and at the right time, so it's effective for PAYA purposes. And the consequence of not doing so is that the PAYA remains due and payable on the salary sacrifice, regardless that the salary is not being paid to employees. Next slide, please. not proposing to, to run through all the uh, benefits notes on this slide, um, and also just to note they're not an exhaustive list, but it was just intended as a reminder that there are quite a few benefits which can be provided tax and or cost effectively. So with the advent of auto enrolment, pensions must be provided to relevant employees, and it probably remains the most common benefit provided in conjunction with salary sacrifice, as it's specifically excluded from the opera legislation. The only requirement really is that the employer pension contribution must be made into an approved pension scheme for it to be outside the scope of employment income and NIC. So employer payments into a pension scheme rather than giving the employee cash in order for the employee to make the contribution mean the employer save NIC at 13.8% as well as the employee at their rate. But obviously the introduction of pension tapering and reductions in the maximum amount which can be contributed tax-free mean that employer pension contributions are less attractive to higher paid employees. But it is just worth noting that regardless, if, if there is an income tax charge by self-assessment in consequence of breaching pensions limit, limits, this does not change the NIC position. So there is still a, a modest saving to be had. And on a related note, the first £500 of pension advice arranged by employers for their employees in the tax year is also exempt from income tax and NIC. But again, there are availability conditions to be met with this benefit. Childcare vouchers and directly contracted employees supported childcare remain tax exempt, subject to conditions being met. But for those employees who participate, for those employees who participate prior to October 18, but are closed to new joiners. So um, the cost of provision of workplace nurseries remains fully exempt from income tax and NIC, even when provided in conjunction with salary sacrifice. So it's quite attractive, but there are a number of conditions um, which must be met, and hence for many employers, it's not a viable option. But within the exemption criteria, it is possible to partner with others to provide a workplace nursery. And what is ex expecting practice is set out in HMRC guidance. It is worth noting we are aware that there are some schemes marketed by benefits providers which purport to meet the, the partnership conditions but may and not in fact do so. So if this is something you are, have already implemented or, or are considering doing so, then we 
strongly recommend that employment tax advice is sought to make sure that it is um, effective. There are quite a few benefits we're exempt, provided they're not part of a salary sacrifice arrangement. And some, but by no, no means all, do require the benefits to be made available to all and all monetary limits amongst um, the exemptions. An exemption which is perhaps sometimes overlooked is the provision of a works bus, um, which is again subject to conditions, but around sort of seating capacity and its use. But whether this is viable will depend on office location um, and how and from where employees travel. But for example, it can be used between the station and the work location. And with higher fuel costs, although a bit lower than they were, um, this may reduce employee outgoings and also be attractive to businesses and employees um, seeking ways to reduce their environmental impact. It's also worth mentioning the exemption for free or subsidised food at the workplace. This is commonly referred to as the canteen exemption, but that is slightly misleading and that legislation does not require there to be a canteen, but rather that food must be provided on the employer's premises. Whilst the food doesn't need to be available to all or all employees at a particular location, it can be food which the employer buys in and makes available. So for some employees, provision of free or subsidised meal may be particularly welcome at a time when food prices are increasing, but obviously it will depend on your workforce. I've already um, touched on utilising corporate spending power and corporate discounts, I'm not going to cover them again. I mentioned that cars are subject to their own specific taxing rules, and I'm sure most people are familiar with the taxable value being determined by applying a fixed percentage to the list price of the vehicle. And there are obviously, of course, other nuances to consider. The rules for electric vehicles are actually no different, but what is attractive is that the fixed percentage is 2% for electric vehicles in a range of 130 miles or more, and this has been fixed into the 2024-25 tax year. And also that electric vehicles are outside the, um, the scope of the opera legislation. So provision of electric vehicles in conjunction with salary sacrifice is an attractive benefit for some employees and may enable them to obtain a, a more efficient, a, a better and more efficient car and more cheaply than they could perhaps secure themselves and in a cost neutral way to the employer. And finally, I just wanted to briefly mention the use of shares and share options. This is a huge topic of its own. Um, and we have <laughs> uh, colleagues that specialize in this area, um, but they can be used to align employee interests, potentially without upfront cost to the employer or immediate tax consequences to the employee. And depending on the arrangements might be tax efficient too. Um, and in the global context, it is also possible to implement tax efficient plans as sub plans under a global scheme. So it's certainly something that's worth exploring. Next slide, please. You may have noted on the previous slide that loans to employees of less than £10,000 in total are exempt from income tax and NIC. Although there are income tax and both employee and employer NIC a consequence if the loan is written off rather than repaid in the future. Loans have traditionally been used to help employers with the cost of travel to work, as the cost of paying up front for an annual season ticket using the loan is much cheaper than buying tickets each month. But that same principle can be applied to other items that the employee may need, which could be bought more, more cheaply up front than in instalments or potentially by securing credit elsewhere. And even where loans are taxable, and note here it's the full value, not just the excess over the £10,000, which is taxable. Um, the present rate of the present official rate of interest, which is relevant here, um, which needs to be applied is 2% of the value of the loan. So the tax due on the benefit or the interest which the employee needs to pay to prevent a benefit arising is actually quite modest. Um, you can figure this out on the slide. But obviously extending loans to employees may not be viable for employers to understand that or potentially may be ill-advised to encourage employees to owe money as obviously as well as any regulatory considerations but you know it is a, a something which might be worth thinking about if it's not done already. Another idea which has come up in conversation with the client recently is assisting employees to reduce their domestic outgoings from their net pay by helping them to secure or providing them with energy efficient appliances or devices. So the precise consequences will depend on the arrangements and the, the principles covered previously will be relevant in kind of deciding what, what the close consequences are. And again, it will depend on the workforce as to whether this is attractive. But for some employees and employers, it may also be sort of attractive as part of a wider green agenda as well. Next slide, please. 
I know we briefly mentioned hybrid working, which I've referred to here as, as home working. And uh, I just wanted to, as part of the session, to briefly touch on this um, and some of the aspects which are not always considered as part of that move away from what was the norm prior to the COVID pandemic. So we see many employers are able to reduce their business costs and therefore overall cost of having employees by reducing available workspace and allowing or requiring employees to work from home some or all of the time. And as Caroline's already mentioned, for many employees, homeworking is very attractive and in, in some cases a prerequisite and they've embraced this, this newfound flexibility. But employers working at home means that most employers will provide equipment to enable them to do so. And there is a tax exemption for, for this, which existed long before the, the pandemic. But as with most exemptions, it does have requirements which need to be met. And so one of those is that the equipment is provided by the employer and therefore costs reimbursed to employees will not qualify for this exemption. And there was a temporary relaxation around this as part of the um, COVID um, pandemic, but that has now ended. And a bigger issue, um, which we, we often see, is, the, is what to do with the cost of home to work travel. Um, you know, and sometimes employees are now expecting that to, to be paid for. So unless there is some specific requirement, which means the role has to be performed at home, it's likely that the employer's premises will be a permanent workplace for tax purposes. But it obviously will very much depend on the specific fact pattern. Um, Assuming the employer's premises is a permanent workplace for tax purposes, then travel from home or some other personal location to that premise will be considered commuting and thus subject to income tax and NIC and possibly deductible by a PAY um, if the costs are borne by the employer. So this will have an impact on the way expense claims are made and processed or centrally incurred costs are identified and captured and obviously around internal policies and processes and controls which will need to reflect the change. And depending on what has been agreed with employees, this could also leave employers with the income tax and I see to settle on an increased basis in addition to the cost of the travel itself. And you've already seen that, you know, for, for a 40% tax pay, this can nearly double um, the, the cost of, of providing such things. It is also possible to provide homework allowances um, tax free. And for the interest of time, I wasn't proposing to cover um, this any further than to say, obviously, again, there are conditions which, which need to be met there. Next slide, please. Um, and whilst this session is really about the cost of employment and effectively maximising that cost, we've, and we've obviously focused on current employees, the final aspect to consider is that it may also be necessary to reduce headcount to, to reduce costs. And it's also therefore important to understand the, the rules surrounding termination payments in order to that the, the, the benefit to what the employees is maximised and the cost to the business, including the employer NIC, is known and planned for. So the taxation of termination payments is complex, and again, it probably warrants a whole session of its own. But contrary to popular belief, it should not be assumed that the first £30,000 of all payments is always exempt from PAY and NIC. It will very much depend on what is being paid and for what purpose. And if benefits are provided as well, those will also need to be considered. In addition, new legislation from 2018 imposed rules to tax notice pay such that part of a termination may be subject to PAY and NIC regardless that it is not described as being for the notice period if the notice is not worked in full. And at the same time, changes were made to the exemption for foreign service relief, meaning it's now only applies in very limited circumstances. It's obviously relevant, very relevant to those with a globally mobile workforce. And obviously, more generally, employees have been working overseas, there may be implications in other countries. Historically, if the first £30,000 of a qualifying payment was exempt from PEDS, well, the whole amount would be exempt from NIC. But now, employer-only Class 1A NIC is also due on the element above the £30,000. This obviously needs to be factored into the cost, and as well as any Class 1A um, employer NIC, which needs to be paid on any non-qualifying payments. As Jackie will cover next, the, the cost of getting it wrong can be quite expensive. Um, so on that note, I will hand over to Jackie Roberts, who's one of my fellow directors in the team. Thank you, Claire. Gosh, that was a lot to, to go through, wasn't it? Uh, right. Um, so next slide, please. OK, so um, the cost of getting it wrong. 
And of course, um, hopefully that's not the case, but in the event that there is some weakness that um, happens, um, I'm going to just go through some of the, the things that you need to think about in terms of those costs. Firstly, there is um, the failure to operate the payroll correctly. So PAYE or class one national insurance or class one A uh, national insurance uh, hasn't been correctly paid due to incorrect returns of one sort or another. So firstly, the page when national insurance is never grossed up by HMRC, that's a misconception, um, and one we see uh, quite often um, where um, clients are um, working out how much is, needs to be paid over to HMRC in any settlement. So that's one thing to uh, think about. Um, the, second, the, the second thing is the statutory interest there. Um, obviously, with the, uh, the economic climate as it is at the moment, we have seen an increase in inflation and our interest rates from HMRC have uh, been affected too. In fact, in 2022, there were nine increases in the interest, such the interest that's charged by HMRC on unpaid PAYE national insurance and class 1A. And from the 6th of January, that has risen to 6%. So not a small uh, number at all. Uh, I think Claire's already mentioned actually that uh, if you've got a failure to report, so you've got some benefits that haven't been reported and the uh, employer chooses to settle the tax due on behalf of employees, that is grossed up um, and the effective rate can be around 90%. Then there's the penalties. So uh, if in the event uh, we do find ourselves in a position where PAYE and NIC or Class 1A has uh, been unpaid, uh, note that it's not uh, for the greater benefits in kind, there may be penalties. And those penalties can be between 0 and 30% uh, where we have um, an error that has been um, incurred by a company. So behaviours would be looked at by HMRC to decide on what that level of penalty can be. Um, where the um, error is identified before HMRC come in, a prompted, sorry, an unprompted disclosure, so one way you approach HMRC uh, in advance of any uh, contact by uh, HMRC could in fact um, mean that the penalty is restricted to not to 15% depending on the, the number of years involved. So there, if you do have um, a potential weakness and you have done some work to establish that you might need to go to HMRC, there's a savings being made from doing that as a voluntary disclosure. And the cost of getting it wrong also, they've got the reputational damage, haven't we? So, um, yeah, the, the broadsheets, uh, the, the press mention about um, somehow, you know, the information gets out about um, things that have gone wrong in a business. And then you've got the actual naming and shaming um, program for national minimum wage that needs to be uh, taken into account as well. So uh, next slide, please. Try not to concentrate too much on the actual PAYE and national insurance. Let's think about how we can um, help you uh, take a more active role in that. So what's the HMRC acuity right now? Um, obviously this is UK domestic um, specific, but there would be activity in other tax jurisdictions, um, which would be um, not covered under this um, webinar. So we've got cyclical HMRC reviews. So reviewed by your customer compliance manager if your business is considered large, or uh, standard page learn reviews or even aspect reviews. Um, we also find that uh, if it's a global mobility issue, the inquiry would actually come from the same team. Um, then we've got targeting by HMRC. So we've got uh, the CJRS task force um, that has recently announced that it will close down. Um, it hasn't been quite as effective as they had anticipated. However, the work doesn't stop. Um, the CGRS um, uh, compliance will be overseen by the uh, normal employer compliance officers. Then we've seen that um, where a CGRS review has been undertaken, it has in fact led automatically to a national minimum wage inquiry. So it's worth thinking about that. 
and there have been short-term business visitor agreement uh, inquiries. So where the agreement is in place, that's not sufficient. HRC have actually been asking, are you actually doing everything correctly with your submission? And then um, I got to HMRC nudge letters. So see, there's there's lots of those in other areas of tax, but now we're seeing them more in the area of IR35. Um, these letters appear not to be sent to any particular size of business, um, although I do expect HMRC will concentrate on the larger businesses. But essentially, they are asking a business to, within 30 days, uh, respond and confirm that they have assessed all individuals for employment status purposes and appropriately process any payments through the payroll where they are a deemed employee. That's 30 days. It's not very long to make that decision. And although it's not an inquiry in itself, it is therefore an audit trail that HMRC could use uh, once um, and if the um, business responds to HMRC's nudge letter. We've also seen an uptick in um, joint uh, inquiries, more so from corporate tax um, rather than VAT, but I've just added in VAT because that I know that there are a few, um, particularly around termination payments. So where uh, it's looked at from the, the perspective of whether the termination payment is actually uh, for, for the purposes of the business or corporation tax, and then to go on to have a look at the PAYE and national insurance impact. Then we've got um, not so much the activity, but more the governance um, criteria of corporate criminal offence uh, review being undertaken. Um, my corporate criminal offence colleagues tell me that currently HRC has seven such reviews um, ongoing um, and that they are coordinating the CCO reviews and the SAO re reviews as well. Obviously, the CCO applies to all, whereas the senior accounting officer only applies to businesses with a UK turnover of 200 million or more and um, assets, gross assets of 2 billion. So another couple of areas where HMRC are looking at employment tax specifically in those areas. And finally, we've got the um, uncertain tax treatment. Um, the same uh, criteria applying the 200 million and 2 billion for the size of the business. But there are rules requiring businesses to notify um, of any tax advantages that may have been taken as a result of an uncertain tax treatment um, of five million or more. And that's in respect of any return that is uh, due after the 1st of April 2022. In fact, there are some quite severe penalties for uncertain tax treatment failure to notify, ranging from five to 50,000. Uh, depending on the circumstances. Next slide, please. So just, and, and actually this has been alluded to all the way through, but just some of the areas where it's worth thinking about how can we avoid those penalties and how can we mitigate um, uh, any of the, the uh, risks. So any decision that is made or any approach that is uh, taken by a business that is not in the norm for just you know, salary or straightforward remuneration, we recommend that, that, that the decision is recorded and that where you've got uh, due diligence uh, requirements, that those are taken into account, particularly in things like labour supply chain, where HMRC are very active. This provides the audit trail that you need, and then you've got your processes and policies um, that, that need to be in place uh, and processes obviously will help in terms of continuity of staff if they were to leave, but also demonstrating for HMRC that reasonable care has been taken in all areas. Um, and that sort of like, you know, beds into things like the CCO and SAO and tax strategy as well. I think some of the, the reason that we see problems in, in weaknesses is actually because employment tax covers such a breadth of um, uh, areas. So it, some of it might fall to an employment tax manager, some of it global mobility manager, some you know, it might be that the head of taxes, the overall uh, key stakeholder, or finance, HR, or payroll. And occasionally what happens is some of the, uh, the processes that need to be undertaken actually just fall through the cracks. So it's a case of maybe just making sure that all, um, all departments are talking to one another. And then the 
once a walk departments are talking together um, that there is regular training um, uh, of all those uh, in response of all of the uh, obligations that are there. And then also once that the training has been implemented, it's a case of we've got our policies and processes, but we need to make sure that those that were implemented check that they are adapting to the changes and remain fit for purpose as we go on. That's a whistle stop through uh, the uh, how, how we can help. And I'm just going to pass you back to Caroline, who's going to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, that's been really, really interesting. And I hope that um, people will be staying around because we've got some great questions over the next couple of minutes. So I'm just going to very quickly put some of these back to everybody. Um, just to answer the last question first, yes, the recording will be shared um, in due course and there will be some um, slides coming out pretty quickly um, even in advance of the recording being shared because that's technologically easier. So moving straight on to the questions, the first one I am going to um, put straight back to Jackie. Sorry, Jackie, you're gonna to have to come back on camera and off mute. Um, the question is, failure to report on benefits for numerous prior years. Could the employer settle the underpaid class 1A NIC but ask HMRC to collect the tax owing directly from the individuals? Thanks, Caroline. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's um, a, a really good question. And yes, they, they can. Um, I think what we find, though, is that where uh, an approach is made to HMRC to settle on that basis, i.e. you're saying that you don't want to settle on behalf of the employees, HMRC wield their baton of threatening the P11D uh, penalties. Um, in practice, I, I'm not sure that anyone has actually seen the £3,000 per P11D penalties um, sought. But it is used in order to, as I say, wield a baton and, and get the uh, company to settle on a grossed up basis. That said, you can do it um, and you can ask H uh, HMRC to go back to the individuals to collect the tax directly. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. John, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, this is an off payroll working question. So can you come back with, I'm going to wait for John to come on screen and come off mute. Lovely. Um, what type of controls are you seeing other clients apply to consultants, sole traders, etc., coming into an organisation through the procurement function rather than HR, I think is, is, is the distinction there, or rather than through finance? Does HMRC expect a full CEST determination or can you just apply certain parameters around control, mutuality of obligation and personal service to satisfy the standard of reasonable care? Wow, that, that's a, a big question, and I'll try <laughs> not to turn it into a, an even bigger answer. Um, so bear with me, I'll unpackage it a little bit. Um, so the CES tool that HMRC have, Check Employment Status for Tax, is their tool. They say that if you go through the, that um, and answer it properly, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, they will stand behind the answers that it gives. That's greater in many ways, but sometimes it comes out with a unable to determine answer, which gives you no further way forward, unfortunately, apart from to, to delve into the details. If you do use Cessna and it tells you that that person is um, outside of, of um, PAYE, then you can uh, carry on on that basis as long as, and it is as big as long as, you are confident that the information you've put into CEST is um, uh, capable of being defended if HMRC challenge it. And unfortunately, the old adage of garbage in, garbage out is most definitely um, uh, in point there. So, so by all means use CES, but use it guardedly, I think. And, and by what by that, I mean, make sure that it's not just being used by people who, in a nice possible way, don't necessarily understand the questions being asked or the importance of the answer that they're giving. Um, in terms of it being within procurement and not HR or indeed not in the tax function or elsewhere, it's all down to the, the knowledge and the quality and the ability of the people making those determinations. So I don't wish to say that those in any one team are going to be better than another as long as they have proper training. So I think some organisations it's dealt with at procurement level and then it's escalated to a, um, a more detailed review. Could be in-house lawyers, it could be the tax function, it could be somebody who's the, uh, the status champion within that business. 
it's horses for courses, I'm afraid, Caroline, to answer the question. But but you, if I suppose the, the, the only extra bit of advice I can give in the time available is is if you're an outsider looking in, does it pass the sniff test? You know, so have you got appropriate people looking at it in the appropriate detail, forming the appropriate answers that are capable of being standing up to challenge? If the answer to that is yes, it doesn't matter whether they're in procurement or HR or tax or wherever else it may well be, but you've got to have those processes in place. Otherwise, I'm afraid you're taking a gamble. Uh, and it's always easy for somebody to come along and say, no, I would have come up with a different answer based on those facts, uh, sometimes several years later. Yeah. There's no one size fits all answer, is there? It depends on the training that your relative teams have got, the complexity of the arrangement and just looking at each individual case on its facts, isn't it? And yeah. if you need help, ask for it, because there's, there's lots of support yeah. out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thank you. Right, I'm going to turn to Claire now. Claire, I've, I've been asked this question, well, I haven't, we've been asked this question um, in a couple of different ways by a number of different people. So I'm going to try and amalgamate them. So bear with me. Um, during COVID, it was quite well known that there was a six pounds um, per week allowance to take account of working from home expenses that employees could claim um, directly on their tax return. What are the implications? How does that work now? And what are the implications of hybrid working? Let's say somebody is working one or two days a week. Is there a difference if the person's asked to work on a hybrid basis or if it's come from their employer? OK, so, yeah, so good, good questions. So um, I briefly mentioned the, the home working allowance and going to any details earlier. Um, it's it's the, the six the six pounds per week. And that during the COVID pandemic, it didn't require the employer to pay it. There was a temporary relaxation to the exemption. So the exemption is where the employer pays something to the employee for the additional cost of their, um, their home expenses, that sort of heat, light, and so on. Um, and there needs to be a formal working uh, home working arrangement. So therefore it can work where it's hybrid, doesn't need to be a full-time home working arrangement, but there is some formal arrangement um, where, where the employee works at home. But since I think it's just the 21, 22 tax year where there was this temporary relaxation where the employee could make a claim um, based on the same basis for their, their costs, that that is no longer the case. The employer has to pay something. And I think it's just worth mentioning that it's also, whilst we talk about the six pounds a week um, and it's obviously a monthly amount, it does not need to be limited to that if actually the costs are higher. So but that would need to be evidence. Also the, the ease of the, the fixed sum is it can be paid without any further analysis. Whereas if an employer wants to pay more, they do need to know that what they're, what they're paying is, is covering those additional costs and not something else. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. That was really helpful. Just two more questions. Um, the first one um, is going to you again. So stay on the line. Would an ad hoc or regular staff outing be tax exempt if offered to all employees? Or is that only applicable if it's annual? Okay, so <laughs> there is an annual events exemption, which as it says on the tin, does need to be annual. So if you sort of, I think the question is um, ad hoc or regular. So if it's regular every spring, then that may well qualify um, under, the, under the annual events exemption. Um, and obviously it needs to be available to all and the, the, there is obviously an overall um, limit per, per tax year of, of the £150 per head, including VAT. So also whether it's exempt may also depend on what other annual events are made available to employees. Um, if it's not um, annual or doesn't otherwise meet those criteria or there's no headroom in, in that exemption, it may potentially be exempt um, under the trivial benefits legislation. Um, again, depends on the fact that that's more limited in scope. So it limits the, the total value per head at, at 50, 50 pounds per employee. It can't be contractual um, or reward for, for service. Um, so it's a little bit um, narrower in its application and also can't be cash. It does need to be something provided by the employer, not um, reimbursed. So there is sort of potential, on, I guess, under both those headings. But yes, if it's not annual, then it won't be the annual events exemption, which you need to think about. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Jackie, last question for you. Um, hello. You mentioned hello. that nudge letters, uh, you mentioned nudge letters from HMRC. Um, is everyone going to get them or is it just complex businesses or smaller businesses? Who, who's going to, who should expect a nudge letter? Um, 
Well, um, I, I think the thing is, at the moment, the, the nudge letters that we've seen have um, been received by clients of all different sizes and all different businesses, actually, so different sectors, so nothing very specific at the moment. Um, but but I, I think that there'll be a lot of concentration to begin with on businesses that are heavy with um, contingent labour force uh, workforce. Um, and, and then maybe um, as time goes, uh, they might concentrate on more, or in fact, just use a normal page of a cyclical review to look at IR35, concentrating the larger businesses at the beginning but don't know for definite so uh, watch this space thank you jackie and i'm going to take the last question because i think i should answer one as well which is um can you offer electric vehicles through a salary sacrifice arrangement yes you can they're one of the very few benefits that the optional remuneration rules do not apply to so if you have a salary sacrifice and you provide an electric vehicle the individual is taxed on the benefit of the electric vehicle which currently is very low in terms of the value of the benefit and we expect that to be the case for at least the short to medium term so i think that is all of the the general questions that were put to the panel. So my main takeaways from today are that um, you need to look at the structure of your workforce, make sure that it fits you as a business. Is it in the right jurisdiction? Do you know where your employees are working from? Is the person you think is in Camberley, are they actually in Germany? So make sure you know where that employee is and that they're being taxed appropriately and they're not setting up issues for the future like a permanent establishment in a country you weren't expecting. Um, make the most of your employee spend. Claire talked about making sure that your employees get what they want. Hold focus groups, find out what they value. I did one once where the most important benefit provided by the company was the lady who collected the dry cleaning cost them nothing. So do make sure that you focus on what do employees want, what do they value, make sure that your global expensive po expenses policies cover um, the whole range of jurisdictions that you are looking at in terms of don't provide something that's tax efficient in one or two jurisdictions but gives you a real headache somewhere else. Make sure you understand it and you're providing things cost effectively because as Jackie has mentioned, the cost of getting it wrong can be significant. We gave examples in UK taxes because there wasn't time to look at everywhere, but make sure you understand what the implications are for you in the jurisdictions in which you operate and that you don't waste money on penalties use it to spend on your employee pay your employee benefits on that i should thank you very much um, there will be copies of the slides provided and there will be a recording coming out um, shortly after that so thank you very much for staying with us um, and I'll, I'll hand back to linda just to close thank you caroline um, I'm afraid we have overrun, but thank you so much for staying on the call and carrying on listening. As ever, this is a complex subject, and while, while we've focused on the UK today, I hope you've gained some ideas about what you need to be thinking about, whatever countries you may be working in. Uh, but clearly, specific tax advice is advised for individual circumstances. My thanks again to Caroline, John, Claire and Jackie for their insights and to you for joining us and taking part. And it's wonderful to have so many questions. A quick reminder, finally, that if you're a member of the GMPD programme, don't forget to submit a learning log to earn points. And thank you once again for coming along and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye from all of us.